Harnessing the natural elements to create energy is a long-held dream for many Alaskans. The great land with its abundant wind, water, sun, and geothermal resources is a vast storehouse of energy available for the taking. Despite being a rich producer of fossil fuels, Alaskans are demonstrating a growing interest in reducing their dependency on high-cost petroleum products. A stream can become a small hydroelectric plant. A constant source of wind may be harnessed to produce electricity. The sun used to provide heat and power electronic equipment. Heated water from the Earth's interior channeled to provide heat for homes and greenhouses. These are some of the ways Alaskans are beating the high cost of heating and lighting their homes and businesses, gaining a measure of energy independence for themselves. The bush communities of Alaska are in the vanguard of alternative energy seekers. Out here, the cost of fossil fuels can be more than double the cost of gasoline and heating oil in road-connected urban areas. Conservation is also becoming a common practice. Dillingham resident Steve Benke is experimenting with passive solar heat in his super-insulated house. This uh, greenhouse was conceived as a way of demonstrating what an attached greenhouse could could do in the Dillingham area or other areas of rural Alaska you know where we've got uh, uh, pretty cool coastal climate and uh, you know not a lot of sunlight but enough but enough Sun that, uh, that we figured that it could make some contribution to heating the house I have steel drums for a heat storage system in this greenhouse there intended to to take excess heat and uh, store heat so that in the evenings when the when the greenhouse cools off it, it uh, there is that cools off outside it stays warmer in here I tried to stay pretty simple in, in building this because the idea was was to demonstrate a, a design that you know that didn't require a lot of complicated materials or construction methods and uh, so everything in it is intended to be something that's reasonably easy to acquire in rural Alaska and reasonably easy to build for someone without specialized skills. Well, the only uh, evidence of anything different, I guess, about this house is that the, the walls are, are 12 inches thick and we have, have 10 and a half inches of insulation in them. And really the only, only thing that looks different is in the width of the, width of the thickness of the walls. It's uh, not something that you notice looking at the outside of the house particularly. I've been real pleased with the way the, the greenhouse and the house work together and uh, even on cold rainy days we, uh, you know, generally it'll stay, stay plenty warm enough to be comfortable although we do start a fire, just to make a quick fire sometimes to take the dampness off. The heat recovered from his greenhouse and conserved by thick insulation, Steve Benke calculates that heating his house will cost less than $100 a month. One of the most innovative conservation practices to be found in the bush is a method of recovering heat from diesel engines that would ordinarily be wasted and using it to heat an entire school. Dave Bowker, manager of Nushagak Electric in Dillingham, developed the idea. Well, the state financed uh, to the tune of $150,000 a waste heat system, a demonstration waste heat project to serve the grade school up there. And what we did, we installed two heat exchangers, one in the powerhouse and one in the grade school, and ran an eight inch insulated heat loop coming out of the powerhouse and traveling up to the grade school where it enters another heat exchanger and interfaces with the uh, school's heating system. This is a jacket water cooling system for all of the engines in the powerhouse. The jacket water goes into the heat exchanger, warms up the heat exchanger, and goes back out here. At the same time, it heats up a pipe here which goes all the way up to the grade school 
and heat, heat exchanger up there, and then the return comes back here. Since approximately the 1st of January, we've delivered about 440 million BTUs of waste heat to the grade school, which has offset about 5,000 gallons of stove oil. And this uh, probably reflects uh, an offset of about $6,000 in fuel costs or thereabouts. We plan on expanding the system to the courthouse, to the high school, to the Southwest Region Schools facility, and also the state uh, highway department complex. The unicleate experiment at this time it has been a very successful project. It took a long time to get it installed, but the idea that a local utility was able to install their own wind systems, and they've got three of them up in operation at this time, should be a model for the rest of the state. We've uh, demonstrated the fact that a wind farm can, in fact, go out and or can be erected in rural Alaska and can operate. And it can be done by the local utility, which is the key point. So I feel that that's one of the premier developments or demonstrations that we have going at this time is that unit fleet wind demonstration. In 1979, Bob Foote of Unilacleet said he believed he could reduce the town's dependency on diesel fuel by harnessing the wind. He lobbied the state legislature and received a $100,000 grant administered through the Division of Energy and Power to erect three wind generators. The idea was, was for three generators here to have an input into our direct generation over at the power plant so that we could get an evaluation of our wind here in Unilaclean. Uh, we have quite a consistent wind here through the winter time. From the 1st of October till the 1st of April, we have oh, an average of approximately 16 miles an hour, and that's very effective on wind generation. If you have a vicinity of 11 miles per hour average throughout the year, it is economically feasible. If you're if below 10 k below 10 miles an hour it is not feasible because your investment that you have takes too long for it to pay off uh, by the time these machines are worn out say 20 years these machines would return to unilocleet approximately one million dollars would be saving unilocleet one million dollars in these just these three machines right here these machines will pay for themselves at the rate and saving of oil alone at about $25,000 a year. So in four years, it has completely wiped its indebtedness off. Pilgrim Springs, a geothermal oasis near the Arctic Circle 60 miles north of Nome. These hot springs may have the potential to produce electrical power from steam-driven turbines and heat greenhouses in which vegetables could be grown, perhaps enough to supply the entire Seward Peninsula. C.J. Phillips is president of a corporation interested in developing well, Pilgrim Springs. Uh, we have enough, uh, just from the holes that we've discovered here, we've got uh, enough hot water, they estimate, to uh, uh, heat 150 houses, or 15 acres of greenhouses. So we think it has, as a recreational area and uh, uh, a farming area here, uh, we think it has uh, has got uh, immense possibilities. Geothermal, uh, all over the United States, has been the most popular thing in the world, and uh, uh, the money to do real exploration is hard to get. And uh, so uh, we would like to get one or two projects here in Alaska that. Uh, that are operatable and if possible get a, uh, uh, they've got a new system that was developed I think in Israel and uh, it's called the Rankin Cycle engine and uh, it can operate on water less than boiling point at 195 degrees to 180 to 95 degrees and uh, so there is one of those available and we were hoping that uh, our uh, probes this year that we put down would come up with enough hot water to maybe get a, say, 
maybe a 25 kW or something like that uh, to test the possibilities here. So we're still in the testing stage, so, and we haven't got the final report on what they found this past year. One time, this was considered one of the places uh, to really go from Nome. They would even come up here by dog teams in the early days, and uh, uh, people would come even walk in here from the railroad, which used to come within about uh, 15 miles of here. The Pilgrim Project's a pretty creative project, uh, and that's probably why the government's involved in it this time rather than private enterprise. Um, on the Seward Peninsula, you have some, some major problems in, in the uh, economic stability of it. Uh, you don't have a lot of employment, you don't have a, a lot of uh, development going on where people can get jobs in a cash, in a cash economy that uh, we function under in the United States. Seward Peninsula has been kind of left behind. Some places they got 70, 80 percent unemployment in some of the villages. Right now there's like a 40 cents difference in the price of vegetables in, per pound on, in Nome as there are in uh, like Anchorage. So if you can beat that, if you can grow vegetables up there for 40 cents more than you do in town, you can make it an economic, economically viable option. And something like that could employ nine, 10, maybe as many as 20 people supplying two or three million dollars worth of vegetables a year to the, to the Seward Peninsula. That would be a local resource being developed for local mar markets. Gives a degree of dependent, independence for the people on the Seward Peninsula gives them a continued base for employment um, and also utilizes a resource that at this time is going unused. People will come here to look at my project and and they will remark, uh, oh, this, uh, where did you learn this? Uh, the point is, I haven't learned very much at all. I have just merely used uh, old principles and applied them in new ways. Uh, anyone can do this uh, if you will just search back through time and to, to find out what was done years ago and apply it to the present day conditions. The desire for energy self-sufficiency has been a lifelong pursuit for Everett Drashner. Here on his homestead at Cantwell, south of Fairbanks, he and his family produce energy from wind, sun, and coal. They conserve energy by living and working in areas that are underground. Through the years, I've been pursuing self-sufficiency, and, and uh, a couple of years ago, I got a grant to build uh, an underground greenhouse. So this grant just helped me in, in pursuing the, uh, our dream of uh, self-sufficiency. Here is one of the 10 solar collectors that we're going to mount to heat water in the 1,000-gallon storage tank. These are collectors that we made entirely by, uh, here on the homestead. Uh, it's our own design using a new type material. We've tested these, and we know that they work, and we've done it for, we've built them for about half of what they would cost if you uh, purchased them commercially. As I say, we're going to have 10 of them, and they will be mounted as this one is just standing here now. We haven't mounted it yet. But they will, they will stand vertically, and the, there will be two in a pod. There are, there are five pods, and the point of this, this pod will be directly south, so that in the morning, uh, the sun will hit a collector, say it'll hit this one, then in the afternoon it'll hit the other one. And we stood them vertically as opposed to angling them against the sun for the reason that we're uh, after the reflection uh, from the lake and from snow and ice and the mountains. And we believe that we will get uh, more efficiency out of them by having them vertical than, uh, than angled. Passive solar heat alone keeps the greenhouse temperature in a comfortable range even on this winter day. This greenhouse is essentially a big heat sink. The entire greenhouse is insulated outside and underneath. We terraced the greenhouse area, as you can see, by, by three separate terraces. 
This was for the purpose of uh, gaining more sunlight from, uh, from the south sun. We uh, buried 2,000 feet of pipe in the floor. Uh, in the first terrace, there's one layer of pipe. In the second terrace, there's two layers of pipe. In the third terrace, there's three layers of pipe. Then the heart of the entire system is a 1,000 gallon storage tank that you see over here in the work area. It will be heated by 10 solar collectors out, out on the south side, which will gravity into the tank. Then it'll be heated also by a second wind plant that we're going to put up on the north side of the building. And all of its output will go into the storage tank. And in case both of those fail, we intend to build a coal furnace over in that area uh, with surrounded entirely by sand with heat pipes buried in the sand so that when we uh, fire the coal furnace it will uh, heat the water in the tank but this will only be used for an emergency then from this tank we will uh, we will pump the water into this 2,000 feet of pipe in the ground the only other fossil fuel the Drashners use in their home is diesel to generate electricity when the wind is still and the storage batteries are drained. That seldom happens. We are now in one of the tunnels that leads from the greenhouse to our living quarters. Uh, this is the section where we have the batteries stored that store the power uh, manufactured by the wind plant. Because the temperature underground here is 40 degrees both summer and winter, and we have opted to use this area for a refrigerator. Sometimes in the summertime when we have both doors open in the ends of this tunnel and it may get a little above 40 degrees so we have dug a hole in the ground and, and uh, manufactured a refrigerator that's, that's guaranteed to be 40 degrees. It's always 40 degrees down there in the ground. Looking back on the way this thing developed here at this homestead, uh, I realized that when I first started, I desired the simplicities. So I built a small place and uh, I purposely did not provide myself with a, a light plant because that was costly. And I thought I'll get by with just the, the simple things, uh, similar to living in a one room cabin you know, way out in the woods. But as time went by, I wanted more and more things. So gradually through the years, and I uh, accomplished this. Uh, I got just about all of the con conveniences that a person could have in a modern city. But then my likes changed, and uh, I started going back to the simplicities again. Uh, that's one reason that I got to a wind plant. That's one reason that uh, I'm into alternative energy now, is because it's a method of having the best of conveniences and yet not the worst of the conveniences. When I first came to this country, the wind and I were more or less enemies. Um, you certainly had to dress for it and it seemed like it always came along to spoil your most interesting outing when you were out skiing or snowshoeing. It made um, it life pretty miserable at times outside. And once we put the wind tower up, and the wind instantly became a friend. I mean, we were getting energy from the wind, and I would go out there and I would want the wind to blow. At first, it was difficult to get used to the idea of DC. Our home is wired entirely with DC. And I did go through a number of appliances. I burned up irons and toasters and, and um, mix masters and <laughs> things like that, uh, forgetting that they were AC rated only and I'd plug them in and a shower sparks would come along and and um, it, you know it was very exciting for a few moments there <laughs> and that appliance bit the dust and gradually I've weeded out my appliances that I can use and the ones that I can't use the ones I can't use went to the garbage dump of course 
Self-sufficiency, of course, is, is a misleading term because I can never be totally self-sufficient. But I'm trying to find the, the highest degree of self-sufficiency that is practical. And I think that we're getting close to it. And I, I think that many other people are learning the same thing that I've learned. And we're all working together to achieve the same goal. Uh, I see this happening all around me. Friends, neighbors, uh, the state in general. Uh, I think it's an encouraging thing. An old alternative energy source that is about to be tested for use in Alaska is called wood gasification. With financing from the state of Alaska, Joe Marks, owner of Marinco, designed a system to create engine fuel from wood. And looking around for an alternate system to replace diesel power generation, we came upon an old technology that was used uh, about 145, 150 years ago. It was common during World War I and II in the European countries, which are short on fossil fuel uh, uh, and derivatives, to use wood to power uh, their trucks and their cars. The sequence of operations is as follows. We will take round wood that a person can handle in about four inch diameter, maybe eight, 10, 12 feet long, that somebody can physically put into a chipper and make chips out of it. After we've uh, chipped them, we put them in a drying bin where we use waste heat from the engine radiator that uh, provides electricity. We use part of that waste heat to drive hot air through the chips and dry them. After uh, we dry the chip, we convey them through a small conveyor automatically into what we call a charge hopper, and all it is is a lock hopper. And that lock hopper will store a charge of fuel, or wood chips if you will, and drop them into the gasifier. In here, we have an incandescent bed of wood chips being carbonized, if you will, being oxidized or burnt. And in so doing, we're driving off, of course, the moisture, the hydrocarbons, the volatiles, and eventually they'll boil off and then travel down through the bed, which is incandescent, and at a temperature sufficient to, uh, to crack the hydrocarbons, which is around 16, 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that point, the gas is manufactured and driven off through the bottom of the reactor off into a cyclone that separates the particulate like ash and char from the gas stream and then eventually into a wet scrubber that may utilize a diesel oil as a scrubbing agent or water. And from there, of course, the gas is further conditioned and filtered before it's fed to an engine generator to make electricity but is gasifying wood to make engine fuel a reasonable alternative? We don't see this as any big economic boon. You know, I don't think gasification is going to uh, take diesel fuel and say, you know, this just doesn't work. What you're looking at is those other considerations that, you know, you're keeping the money in the community. It's probably going to be pretty much an economic wash, uh, unless there was some type of major increase in oil prices. But the idea is that our research is centered on the fact that maybe we can make that work. And you could put it into rural Alaska. Uh, there's probably 100 villages in Alaska that could use, that have wood resources. And if the technology, gathering of fuel, all that stuff can be overcome, uh, then they can use this as a consideration. Instead of just saying, well, our only, our only course in interior Alaska is, uh, is diesel. You know, that's the only thing that's really on the market for us. We're going to hopefully have another alternative that says, yeah, you got gasification, but these are the considerations for gasification. If you guys can solve that, then you have that as, as an option for these reasons to uh, diesel power generation, which you're using today. About eight years ago, we, we contacted Chugaz and the phone company. They wanted over $90,000 to put in uh, a power line to my house from the highway. We decided we needed some running water in the house year-round. And uh, at the same time, we would have liked, liked to, we're checking on the option of just using uh, the, the creek for developing power, too. Pam and I went out and we took uh, periodic checks, creek flow checks. And uh, so we had some sort of a chart to go by. Then we looked at the, the typical tables that you look at for, for wind flow if you're in wind systems or water flow if you're in the hydro. And uh, that's how we geared the size of our pipe and our system was to the creek flow.
In the powerhouse, several hundred vertical feet below the collection point, water is used to create energy by spinning a simple device known as a Pelton wheel. We have your wheel in the center shaft, and the lower jet hits the wheel at the bottom, and the upper jet hits it at the top to keep it spinning. If you have a lot of water, then you can use both jets. If you have a little bit of water, then it's better to use the lower one. When the wheel spins, uh, it turns the belt, which turns the generator, which makes the electricity. I don't mind having the TV sets and the electricity and things like that if I did it myself. Uh, I feel that I, that I deserve it. <clears throat> and if I can do it uh, on a clean, renewable energy source, then uh, uh, obviously I, I would opt for that above all, even if I wouldn't have as much out of it. I could, you know, I could run a propane generator or, or a diesel generator. Um, with the money that we spent putting that hydro in, I could probably run a diesel generator for 20 years. But uh, that isn't what I wanted to do. I don't like the smell of diesel anyway. <laughs> the one area that everybody can probably think of something on is conservation and conservation is the other half. We've been talking pretty much on just uh, supply side. Uh, well, there is a conservation side. And in a lot of cases, if you can save in rural Alaska one barrel of oil, you've probably actually saved three in the fact that you probably may take a bar barrel of oil to get your barrel of oil there. It may take a barrel of oil to produce that oil. So in the overall energy picture for the world, Conservation in, in some of these remote communities may be the number one thing we can do. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that we've been doing here at the office uh, through the audit program, uh, things like that for actual thermal uh, conservation. Uh, the idea that you have an audit program, you can go get $300, low interest loan programs that are being run by the state. Those have a lot of impact. And I think certainly conservation's a, a number one item on anybody's agenda in rural Alaska. We are using old principles and we're applying them to our present day conditions. We are doing this is because our backs are against the wall and we see that something has to be done. We can't go on in the same old way. I think it's just the independence that I mainly like about it. It's a fulfillment of uh, personal conviction, of personal feelings. It's a fulfillment of cooperation from, that I've had from people. It's a wonderful feeling. Yeah.